This edition of Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Tractor Zoom delivering insights. And I have Kyle McMahon, the founder of Tractor Zoom, on here with us. And he comes on about once a month to kind of talk about what's going on in the marketplace and what we see happening out there. So, Kyle, welcome to the show, man. How you been? Good. Uh, thanks for having me on, Casey. No problem, buddy. Surprised to wake up here in Iowa with uh, about an inch of snow. Yeah. Moisture. You guys have been getting good moisture out your way, or has it been fairly dry? You know, this last weekend we got about an inch, but before that, it's it's been relatively dry. Yeah, we could we could use some moisture out here my way too. But so Kyle comes on. Let's talk about what Tractor Zoom is real quick. Refresh everybody what what Tractor Zoom is and and what what it is that you're doing over there. Yeah, certainly. So uh, we're, we're Tractor Zoom is a website and mobile app where farmers go to find farm equipment at auction. We have just under 400 auctioneers that advertise their farm equipment auctions on TractorZoom. So it's a one-stop shop for farmers to go find that equipment. Uh, and then we also have another another uh, company called Iron Comps, which is powered by TractorZoom data. And Iron Comps is where uh, people can go to see auction results uh, and, and grade in their detail and figure out what the current market conditions are doing uh, backed by auction market data. Right on. Okay, so the one thing I like about what Iron Comps and Tractor Zoom bring to the table is um, I'm a data nerd when it comes to, to this stuff. So everything that I can find that gives me uh, an insight to what's happening in, in any segment of the marketplace helps me understand what's going on and helps me better decide what's happened. So Tractor Zoom is one of those things that um, I have found that, that and, and Iron Comps is one of those things that I've found that gives me that information. So Kyle's going to go through some some slides here that kind of outline what it is that, that we're doing. So one of the biggest questions that I get, um, whether it's from customers or from just people in the industry, is, you know, is the PTO really worth the amount of money that you have to spend to get it? and Or any option for that matter, right? So you're trying to get a guy to put... You know, four-wheel drive combines is another thing. You know, there's certain pockets where you can't sell one without it, and then there's pockets like out here where I'm at, for example. Um, if if it's got it on there, no one gives you any more money for it than if it didn't. So it's it's one of those things that kind of go back and forth. Another thing is uh, wheeled four-wheel drives compared to a track machine. And so for today's show, Kyle's going to go over you know, is is the juice worth the squeeze on getting that PTO? And then where is the difference lying in wheel tractors compared to track machines? So, so Kyle, run us through what you got here and show us some of the data and some of the power behind Tractor Zoom and Iron Comps. Yeah, certainly. So, I'll share my screen here. And, and the first thing that we'll go over, the first thing that we'll go over is uh, the PTO. As you were talking about it, you know, PTO. Uh, it can be one of those expenses when you're buying new. Do you really want to justify the expense? Well, well, I think what you'll find in the data I'm about to present is um, what will allow you to make that decision. So I won't j- jump to any conclusions yet. We'll, we'll let the data uh, help show you. So what we're doing here is looking at all all tractors over 300 horsepower that are either track machines or four-wheel drive, and they could be from any make. Case IH, Challenger, um, John Deere, New Holland, whatever it might be. So the first slide we're going to look at, and it, it, this is a depreciation graph. Every dot you see here, and, and by the way, all the graphs I'm going to be showing you over the next 30 minutes or so look very similar to this. So every dot is an auction result. So this is a piece of equipment that is sold at auction, and here we're pulling out key attributes about each. So all of the yellow orange dots are all tractors with a PTO, and all the blue dots are tractors without a PTO. So what you can quickly see here is 
uh, the other thing I should mention is on the left hand side of this graph is the price, the auction price, and then down below uh, is the sum of hours. So how many hours are on that machine when it's sold? So here you get a good depreciation graph of what the value that equipment do over time, and then we're overlaying PTO, yes or no, to understand is it worth it. So if we're looking at all data throughout you know the last two and a half years that we've been collecting this these, these auction results, you can quickly see that early on there you see some parity of people not really wanting to pay any more for a tractor that, that has a PTO or not. But you can quickly see that gap widens once you get to that three thousand to nine thousand hour range. Those used tractors, people are paying a significant amount of money uh, more for that tractor with a PTO. So, for example, if you look at the, the widest part of the graph, 5,000 hours, there is a about a $23,000 price difference between tractors with and without a PTO. People are paying $23,000 more for a tractor with a PTO. What do you think about that, Casey? Yeah, I mean, that's, it's one of those things where, you know, kind of the top end of your graph I've been just kind of studying here. I mean, it looks like, um, oddly enough, the the tractors that are very low-houred are, are undervalued compared to a, a non-PTO unit as you start out. But as you uh, as it widens out, you see that that, that gap comes in. I think the the amount of uh, of used buyers that we have out there right now that are that are trying to source that like new um, feel not necessarily our way our wise but they're really you know dialed into a to a spec that they're looking for and they're going to buy the tractor with the spec on it they they want kind of you know damn the hours to some extent but they're they're going to uh, pay closer to attention to the specs and a lot of it is. That used buyer has no intentions of, of selling it off in a year or two. That this is going to be a machine they're going to keep for five or six or seven years, and I think this data kind of shows that they're more uh, they're more dialed in onto that to that PTO. And obviously, as you see, the widest part of that graph is at probably what between five and six thousand hours. Yeah, that's when you're really seeing the the most bang for your buck when it comes into uh, to what that looks like. So. Um, this makes a lot of sense to what I what I've seen happen in the marketplace. Okay, so again, this is the last two years of data. So I'm going to go to the next slide, and let's look at the last year of data. Now it's a little bit different story. Your lower hour, maybe more late model equipment, people are paying more for that PTO. Yeah. So it could be a a buyer's mentality shift. Or farming practice shift as more guys are hauling manure tanks and more guys are hauling mm-hmm. big grain carts. That PTO early on is is really worth it, and then you can see it retains its value all pretty much parity all the way throughout yeah. the graph. Uh, and then the other thing I want to mention here is there's a good amount of data here for you to look at. There's a good amount of tractors that have sold with and without a PTO. So this is this is a really powerful graph, in my opinion, that that should allow people to make uh, good good purchase decisions on that PTO when it's new. Yeah, yeah. No, this is that's the other side of that too is the the expense that comes along with the with the bigger four wheel drive tractors that we see. Um, you know, it, it, you're spending three hundred thousand or more dollars on something like that. Looks like auction values are are holding in there around that in the in the mid two hundred thousand dollar range. Uh, for a lower hour rig, so if you really start to kind of put dollars to to use buying a uh, a four hundred thousand or three hundred thousand or even a two hundred fifty thousand dollar tractor that you're going to have a single use for, it uh, really doesn't make a lot of sense. So it, the PTO thing really gives it that whole kind of another level of uh, of use. Whether it's like you said, the grain cart thing is where I think a lot of this is starting to to really play in. Uh, more than anything is is the size of grain carts are, get, are getting bigger and uh, the weight and distribution of, of that weight and not so much the horsepower because the horsepower is there on these on the uh, um, some of these row crop tractors but it, it's the weight and, and getting it moving around if you're in sloppy conditions and those kind of things you know a uh, especially a track machine um, 
is starting to uh, kind of poke its head up when you start looking at grain cart use. The other thing that I think paints an interesting uh, picture in this graph is as you get to that six to ten thousand hour range, obviously the depreciation really slows down on that that machine. There are there appears to be more inventory that did not have a PTO. So if you think of supply and demand, if that buyer is really looking for a PTO machine, there's going to be less of them for sale, which also helps elevate the price, right? Supply and demand is going to tell you if a guy can't find exactly what he wants and he's trying to find the right price range, he's going to pay up a little bit more because he knows he can put that PTO to use. Yep. Hang on a second here. I've got something jacked up here. I don't know exactly what happened. Good thing I can edit. Okay. All right. I got all this stuff you just said. We'll just bounce off to the next, to your next slide there. Okay, so if we get, uh, this is a good overall. These are all, uh, all makes and models. So if we start to break it down a little bit further, we're going to break it down into John Deere, Case IH, and Challenger tractors. Uh, three good segments I, th- I think we should look at from a PTO if it's, if it's worth it once you get down to the specific brand. Now, this graph... You know, obviously, in the very beginning, it tells you, hey, I shouldn't be buying a tractor with a PTO if I don't need it. Uh But as soon as it hits that 3,000 hours, suddenly it's paid for itself. And and the other thing that I think shows here is we've seen some some higher dollar, low hour tractors sell uh, without a PTO. And some of those those new RX tractors from John Deere, which, which shows that shows in this graph that they're obviously more expensive. But it throws off that that beginning piece. Right. Uh, once you get into the meat and potatoes, the data down low, call that two thousand hour range throughout the ten thousand, then you really start to see that PTO uh, being worth it. And again, this is year over year data. So yeah, that would be that would, that would make a lot of sense, especially when you start thinking about how that the two thousand hour. 9RX isn't in, isn't really in existence yet, and there's not that been that many um, yeah. higher hour RXs that have been sold at auction yet. So um, <clears throat> when I mean higher, I mean more than you know 1,500 hours type of thing. So I can see where that curve kind of makes some sense. I bet you if you took the RXs out of that, that curve would look very similar to the to the previous slide that you sl- that you showed. It, it it very well could because when we look at case IH. And, and and the next slide, Challenger, they paint the same picture as what the overall graph did is mm-hmm. the PTO is always worth it. Yep. Now here, you see guys, a little bit more volume, more supply at the lower hour machines here. Mm-hmm. But guys are wanting to purchase those primarily quad track tractors uh, with a PTO. It's funny how that narrows on those case tractors. How that narrows between that that four thousand and six thousand range, where your your previous slides data supported that that's one that was the the most valuable. Yep, it's interesting. I, I, you know, part of, part of me wants to say that there could be a. You know, the construction guy is probably better than I do. Yeah, I that's can see probably true. It's, that, that case tractor is really popular. Yeah, from a scraper version. Mm-hmm. You know those construction guys he's usually running pretty hard until that mid three to seven thousand hour range. I can see a lot of scraper tractors being pumped into the market right there. Cool. That's why you see more volume and at a lower price. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a good point. Those construction tractors more times than not don't have PTOs on them. I mean, like infinitely more times than not. Um, right. So yeah, that, that makes some. That's a good point, especially when it comes to the construction side of it. Yep. Yeah, and those the case quad track does have a <clears throat> does have a pretty good um, kind of a, a niched, I guess, marketplace when you start looking at, at what's going on in the construction market for sure. All right, when we sit back and look at challenger tractors, you know, it's generally speaking, it's it's a similar story as what we we're projecting. To get enough data in here, I actually pulled the last two and a half years. Uh, you don't quite get that. Um, more real time or the last year of data, but we needed enough data to make sense. Mm-hmm. What I do want to point out is look at the volume of dots of uh, the, the orange or yellow 
which are the tractors that have a PTO. By and large, there's not a lot of challenger tractors in the market that we're seeing that are being sold without a PTO. Yeah. And when they do, man, that, that's a pretty variable variable price uh, all, all the way throughout there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they speckle in there kind of hit or miss. I mean, there's a, I'll just take this one, for example, they're right around seven, almost probably looks about 6,800 hours or so. There's about three machines in that column, and they range from 60 grand down to less than 20, you know? So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty, so that's a pretty big swing. But it could be, <clears throat> excuse me, it also goes back to, at 6,000 hours, if that's a track machine, it needs to be, the tracks need to be replaced on it. Um, and the undercarriage needs to have some work done to it and those kind of things. Um, you know, I, I can see it taking a beating pretty bad um, on those. Flip side of this, too, kind of back to the case side with the uh, with the Challenger brand and their connection to uh, Caterpillar dealerships, those, uh, those Challenger tractors, especially track machines and four, higher horsepower four-wheel drives, have a, have a pretty prominent... Um, feel in in the construction side of the business too. When you know whether it's pulling pans or whatever it is that they're doing, you know the, those uh, those tractors do have a more of a more of a um, presence on the construction side. So as you start looking at at um, at value, <clears throat> excuse me, at value of those machines, that you know a machine that's got six thousand hours worth of uh, um, construction work on it compared to 6,000 hours worth of ag work on it, there's going to be a dynamically different uh, value when you start looking at auction value. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, there certainly could be. All right, so this is the last slide we have on PTO. Uh, I think it, what you saw in the last five slides was PTO, generally speaking, holds value. Yeah. Uh, regardless of the brand and regardless of the market. So let's jump into tracks versus wheels. Uh, you know, probably a little bit more expensive option from the factory. Uh, would you say that's, that's generally speaking, that would be right, Casey? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's the, depending on the two track or four track system, it's, it's a, uh, it just, yeah, it goes up way up from, from the, uh, the price. But that being said, the systems aren't, any more, you know, one's not more expensive to, to maintain than the other, I don't think. I mean, if you start looking at dollars versus replacing four, eight tires compared to placing tracks and undercarriage, I mean, anymore, it's getting fairly close to, to some parity there. So, there is, but there is a value difference between the two. All right. So, here again, we, I don't think we're busting any myths but we're putting data to confirm what I would generally see as most people would agree with tracks because they're more expensive from the factory. Yeah. Retain their value. And when we look at when we look at all manufacturers above three and a horse, only the track versus wheel models. So it's gonna be like a, for example, a, a John Deere ninety five ten R versus John Deere ninety five ten R T. we excluded any uh, any tractor that would be uh, MFW obviously in here and really only comparing the four wheel drives that they came with a track versus a, a wheeled option yeah a lot more data as you can see here um, it's it's pretty evident no matter where you look at this graph people are paying more for tracks yeah but conversely of what we saw in the PTO once you hit that four to seven thousand hour range People are paying a little bit less for track machines and paying a little bit closer to parity from a wheeled machine. Yeah. The other thing, too, about no. your graph right here, when I'm looking at it, is how the top end of the graph is heavily loaded with track machines. And as, as the machines get older, the, the amount of data that you have for four-wheel drives greatly dominates the, the track data. I mean, there's way more wheeled machines in that 4,000 to 7,000 or even 8,000 hour range than there is on um, between the 0 to 4,000 hour range when, it, when you're looking at 
the number of, of data points. So that's it's kind of just kind of curious about how that why that is. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, if you're looking at that front side of the graph between zero and two thousand hours, yeah, look at the appreciation curve of a track tractor of a wheel tractor. Oh, it's pretty steep. The first yeah. two thousand hours of that track tra- that track machine appears to be pretty expensive. Yep. Yep. And that's the other thing too about those track machines is that especially a two track system is there it's a niche to an area. You know what I mean? Certain areas have more draw for a, a track machine than than other areas do. If you're up in Minnesota, a track machine's different it has a different need and a different feel than if you're in central Kansas. You know what I mean? There's just there's that that kind of regional aspect plays a big big part of that too. <clears throat> all right when we look so this is the last two and a half years of data now if we look at the last year of data painting dang near the same picture yeah of still steep depreciation curve for track tractor as compared to a four-wheel drive tractor up front yep um and and then once you get to that four to ten thousand hours as you were saying it's still heavily dominated by by the wheeled machine versus the track machine. Yeah. And you still see that gap close between five and 6,000 hours. Yeah. You know, we're Casey, we were talking about this, uh, before we got on here of when you look at this, it is, is our buyers really willing to pay more for, or, or is the mentality that a buyer's willing to pay more for a wheeled machine in that five, the seven thousand hour range is you see the gap closes over a track machine because you have more maintenance on track tractor tractor then because then you see that gap get wider mm-hmm. in later later hours uh in the life cycle yeah yep no that's a good point i mean if you look at any machine there's there's uh there's there's hour ranges that pop into place that make a big difference in in, in what the machine value looks like um <clears throat> track tractors being one of those so when you start to hit about 4,000 hours is when you kind of start to see, well, from 3,000 to 4,000 hours is when you start to see that that trend line start to narrow. And that's about the place where you're going to start doing some some 3,000 hours to 4,000 hours. You're replacing tracks. You're doing those kind of things. And then from 4,000 hours on into like that five and 6,000 hour range, you, you're, probably, you're probably replacing tracks again and you're doing some undercarriage work and or more extensive undercarriage work at that point so that doesn't make a little sense that, that you would see something like that happen but i think the uh the um it, it is kind of how how sharp even towards the whole life cycle of the track machine how just the depreciation curve is i mean if you look at the the wheel tractor side of it that depreciation curve stays kind of you know, you see your typical depreciation, and then it kind of starts to kind of flatten out there at the bottom. But there again, between that five thousand hour and eight thousand hour range, the number of wheeled versus track machines you see out there is uh, it's it's almost almost two, um, probably two or three to one uh, that you see anywhere else. That's that is that's quite impressive how that how that work how that is. It's just interesting to see that the front side of the graph so full of of track machines and then the bottom side of the depreciation curve so full of um four wheel drives so that's that's pretty pretty interesting you know uh w- w- with the graphs i'm going to show you the next few slides i'm going to show you that the john deere specific and then the ksih specific what i will be really curious to see casey is this graph in a year or two years once there's been more john deere rx Mm-hmm. Nine R X tractors in the market. Yeah, because what I'm about to show you is that the John Deere two track system. When you look at tracks versus wheels, you have you have a big depreciation curve in the very beginning, right? And then when I show you the next slide, which is Case IH, there it, you don't have as big of a depreciation curve up front. I'm curious if that's the buyer's willingness to purchase a two tra- a John Deere nine R. T versus uh, a quad track. Yeah, yeah. The nine RX, <clears throat> with it only having about three seasons under its belt, right? Three. So it came in. Yeah, I think it's three. It's the third or fourth, third or fourth production year for it. It's uh, 
it is a uh, it's a different animal out there from a data point perspective because there's not that many to, to throw out there. If you go correct, so I, I think that might what you're seeing there might just be a little bit of that. But there again, not too many of those have been put on auction either. So that's not. And yeah, what I'm getting at is I think you're going to see the depreciation curve of those mm-hmm. nine R potentially, right? Yeah. So, so, so it's my hypothesis is you'll see the depreciation curve follow a trend line more like yeah. this wheeled machine does yep. versus have this big drop. Yep. And then, and then obviously there's more data points of wheeled machines later in the life cycle of these, mm-hmm. uh, of these tractors. But when you look at just the RX, I would speculate that they're going to follow what we are seeing in the last year of case IH yep. of you see this parity throughout the first part of the life cycle and you see less of a, uh, a less, less of a gap or more of a gap rather at that five to 7,000 hour range. Yeah. Okay. Before we get into this draft too far, <laughs> I, I, I have to let you know that case age tractors don't actually skyrocket in value after 7,000 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what this polynomial graph is showing is there is no more data uh, for a case age tractor after 8,000 hours right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, tracks versus wheels or, or rather track machines and you see this big clump of four auction results at that right at that eight thousand hour range yeah this data is recognizing hey you see some some uptick in the market there because there's no data points it just goes up so right. for all of you red fans out there don't think your track <laughs> machine goes up in value too quickly it's worth Eight thousand hours is worth as much as new, so it's just hold on, hold on till eight out eight thousand hours. <clears throat> yeah, but look at the gap on these. Yeah. Uh, look at the gap on, like no matter where you look in this graph, that track machine is dang near almost always worth more. Yeah. Yep. So this is why I speculate in the last graph. If we put, if we get John Deere uh, data put in here for their for their four track system, is the depreciation curve and parity going to look more like this? Yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah, back to the John Deere one. I mean, the number of machines that you have at the uh, above three hundred thousand dollar range down to two hundred and thirty thousand dollar range. There's a hundred thousand dollar spread there between between your data points. And it <clears throat> it drops off pretty quick, so that that could be driving some of that that sharp curve that you see there anyway. But um, with the majority of those being uh, track machines, you got to think those are RXs up there that are that are up there high in that that high dollar range. Yeah, well, uh, we can look at that data here in a moment. Okay. Um, have we made a pretty good case for? All makes and models, and yeah. John Deere and KSIH. That I think so. People almost always pay more for yeah. tracks versus wheels, but that that gap does narrow mm-hmm. for most machines in that four to seven thousand hour range, where you pay a little bit, just a little bit more for tracks, maybe ten to twelve thousand dollars more for tracks in that hour range. Yeah, versus that front where you're paying twenty five to fifty thousand dollars more. Yeah, no, it's this has made a pretty good case that if you're going to get a track machine, you're gonna you're gonna at least keep the majority of the of the difference between a wheel machine and a and a track machine. Okay, now let's break it down a little bit further and just look at late model eight R and nine R tractors. Okay. So this is again tracks versus wheels in those two. Uh, model classes this is your 8R 9R and RTs but does not include RX tractors okay so now we have three we have three comparisons here the last two and a half years of data if if you see the four wheel drive and the uh, MFWD are very close in value 
throughout their life cycle. Mm-hmm. Whereas you see the tracks start high, cost you know the cost new of those are more expensive. But then as they get later in their life cycle, they actually cross what the values of those four wheel drives and w- the wheeled machines are, uh, and, and actually goes below. Yep. Yeah, the, the MFWD tractor, though, is, is one of those kind of bread-and-butter type thing. The number of those that get produced in a year are staggering compared to the other two. So the data points are going to be very close together. But it is interesting to watch the four-wheel drive, how it mirrors the value of the of the MFWD through the majority of its life cycle. Then it kind of falls off the table there at the end. But how how consistent the uh, depreciation curve is with on a, on a MFWD? It's very obviously you start out with your with your higher depreciation on the towards the left side of the graph, but as you move to the right, it, it stays. It's a very gradual, consistent drop in 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 depreciation value. It's pretty interesting. Totally. And, and then the other thing to look at at the right side of this graph you know after the 4,000 hours look how many more MFWD tractors there are yeah so 8R yep. 8R tractors versus uh, versus 9Rs yeah there's quite a few that is impressive the number of, the number of data points that are out there for uh, MFWD compared comparatively to the rest of the of the of the world So coming to a conclusion on John Deere, tracks versus wheels. Mm-hmm. The tracks are depreciating quicker off the get-go, and they depreciate further in their life cycle. MFWD and four-wheel drive, so all the wheeled machines, are, are pretty close in value throughout the entire life cycle yeah. depreciation curve. But, uh, you know, what you had mentioned of that depreciation curve of the MFWD wheeled machines on the on the eight Rs really flatten out from twenty five hundred hours. That's a pretty consistent percent drop from call it twenty five hundred hours all the way out to eighty five hundred hours. Yeah. Yep. No, it's that is impressive how that how they maintain the value that they've got comparatively. And then if we look at just 8R and 8R T tractors <clears throat> painting the picture a little bit more of what we were seeing earlier but getting more granular over the last two years of auction data you see tracks again mm-hmm. cross the value of what an MFD, uh, MFWD tractor is Right. the thing I will point out is there is a lot more 8Rs selling in the market than 8RTs. Yeah. And in Casey, yeah. I've always heard you talk about, you know, the bulge in the market. Look at this bulge in the market right here for yeah. uh, 8RT tractors between that 1,500 hour and 3,000 hours. And you really see that depreciation curve speed up at that, that point in time and then level yeah. back off. Yep. Tracks. Replacing tracks on undercarriage work. Which, it always... Kind of I mean to replace a set of tracks on a on an 8RT or any two track system that out there is going to cost you 30 grand or better to do something like that. Um, well, 20 to 30 grand to do something like that, depending on what brand you buy and those kind of things. And then you sprinkle in some undercarriage work, you might spend another, if you have to you know, replace a bunch of bogies and those kind of things, you probably spend another. Five to ten thousand bucks, depending on what you're doing there. So, you could have upwards of fifty grand in, in doing all that, and it would be um, on a MFWD. It's dueled in the front and dueled in the back. You're going to have um, twenty, thirty thousand bucks, probably pretty easy wrapped up in that. <clears throat> so, you are saving some money doing it that way. The uh, the difference in tires is a uh, is 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 cheaper to operate uh, than track machines, but then I'll go back to my previous statement that those uh, where they use a row crop track machine 
um, is uh, is so niche that in those specific areas, this would this I bet this graph would be inverted uh, in in areas where they grow a lot of potatoes and those kind of things because of the amount of, of two track systems that are there. That is a good point. So niched, it's so niched to certain areas. And what they're doing? I'm not impressed. I mean, it's just the sheer number of of uh, and the consistency of the data points on mechanical four wheel drives make a big difference comparatively to to what you see on the uh, on the track side of the graph. Yeah. All right. If we keep moving here and we look at. <coughs> The 9R, 9RT, no RX. We'll show you the RX in a second. I think we will. I think I have that on the next slide. So here you see the same story as what we just saw in the 8Rs mm-hmm. to some degree of the tracks crossing the value of the four-wheel drives. But there's more 9RTs than yeah. 9Rs later yep. in the life cycle. Yep. So buyers have more more uh, opportunity to purchase a 9R2 than they are a 9R. Yep. That guy really doesn't want tracks, doesn't need tracks, and think he needs to pay for it. Might psychologically think that he's going to pay more for a track machine when he's going to auction, when he's looking at auctions. Ends up paying more for a wheeled machine because there's less of them out there. Yeah. Yeah, those data points are, are uh, yeah, you take those those kind of four or five data points up there uh, on the uh, four-wheel drives out of the mix, uh, down there in that 3,000 to 5,000 hour range. Right and here? No, on the, the 3,000 to 5,000 hour range. Oh, sorry, gotcha. Yeah, take those, take those five data points out and you're going to have a uh, pretty much a, a pretty equal depreciation line. That, you're, that you would see it'd almost be the same mm-hmm. huh, so that's a uh, that's interesting I think there's more um, that 9RT it has gained popularity since 2015 so I think there's a there's a, a pretty good opportunity there to make some Make some if you were looking for one. I think there's a great opportunity for you to find some out there, some higher hour rigs. So that's a that's an interesting graph too. You know, I used to live in northern Iowa, big big country. I'd see guys running nine RTs over nine Rs all the time. Most of those guys were were hog producers. They're running those nine RTs double time in the fall, running mm-hmm. a grain cart, and then they're starting to haul manure with them. Yeah, I don't know if. if you know, we see some goofy things at auction where guys don't clean their tractors and so forth. <laughs> Maybe a guy pulled up in the uh, in the auction in one of those nine RTs and still covered full of hog manure. Man, could doesn't be. Look, doesn't look all that great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those don't sell very well. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, let's let's uh, let's dive into with RX machines. So with the four-track four system, what you see here. Um, it's the same line. Again, we're, we were alluding to it earlier. You look at the very front of this graph on the left left hand side, top left. You know those RX machines are pretty new, more pricey. I think you're seeing guys just looking at these nine RXs at the very top. Uh, so I wanted to put this slide in here, but there's such a price difference from the factory from an RX to uh, to just a nine R, so like a four wheel drive tractor. This graph gets thrown off a little bit. Uh, we we need some more data in the market with nine R tractor. Excuse me, nine R X tractors to really paint an accurate picture here, because I don't think this does anybody justice. Of hey, I'm gonna go buy a wheeled machine over a four track machine. Um, I, I, I want to make sure we put that disclaimer in here. I wanted to give give everybody an opportunity to see what the what the R Xs are doing when you compare it here, but I don't think it's fair with a lack of data from a nine uh, from a RX tractor between that 2000 hours and mm-hmm. 8000 like you have on these other machines 
so I want to show you, but you see that appreciation graph really go quick, and I don't think it does those RX tractors justice. No, there's the front load the front side of it, and then there's nothing after that. Totally. So the trend lines are going to be kind of jacked up there a little bit. So let's not spend too much time in this. Let us dive into staggers. Tracks versus wheels. So this is all stagger. Um, any stagger tractor made that had the option of tracks versus wheels, we threw it in this graph. And this is the last, call it two and a half years of data. Man, there's a big difference between tracks versus wheel price tags. Mm-hmm. Throughout the entire depreciation curve of these tractors, you do see uh, parity get closer in the end. But, you know, guys are paying for those quad tracks up front. Yeah. And there's a big price difference. I mean, if you look at 2,000 hours, a guy's, or, or 1,500 hours, a guy's spending $65,000 more. Yeah. Yeah, you have a. Uh, the other thing about this that is the four wheel drive side of it, how consistent it stays comparatively to the kind of towards the the end of uh, of the life cycle, how from about mm, twenty five hundred hours to six thousand hours, the the depreciation sharpens a little more than what you'd see there on the other side but <clears throat> kind of flattens out on the four wheel drive and then it starts to drop off after about yeah. 5,000 hours so a lot more data okay. points on the track side yeah. <clears throat> yeah there definitely are and if we throw out uh, the older style Steigers and we look at more late model mm-hmm. uh, I think I think the uh, if I recall the later later models of uh, Steigers or the previous model Steigers were made between eleven and thirteen, mm-hmm. and all the models that you see here would be made between fourteen and and twenty, something like that. Okay, uh, and, and I went ahead and include those Steiger model numbers uh, in this graph here. So your three seventies, your four seventies, five forties, five eighties, six twenties, and so forth. And again, everybody's paying up for that quad track. Yeah, that's a pretty straight pretty line. Penny. That's a pretty straight line down. You know, it's uh, there's no real kind of bend in that in that line until you get to um, about thirty five hundred hours. It kind of starts to swing back up a little bit, but it's a pretty straight line. Mm-hmm. Again, more uh, more track points, data points than you see anywhere else. Yeah, uh, so that's what I have for PTO and tracks versus wheels. You know, when I when I look at all the data we just looked at and analyzed, better be buying that PTO from the factory. Yep. And depending on what your use case is for a for a track, that two track system with John Deere over the four wheel drive is similar in price once it's in that later life cycle, four to seven thousand hours. Uh, and then there's a big price difference between the RX and, and the R, but you're, I'm assuming you're getting a lot more performance. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, uh, I think the, uh, obviously the track versus wheel thing that looks like as a rule of thumb, we didn't, like you said, didn't, we kind of proved the myth, didn't, didn't bust the myth by any means. So the, yeah. uh, track machine is going to hold its value comparatively. And, uh, but I will say the wheel machines are, I have a more consistent uh, depreciation curve than we see on on the track units across their life cycle. Go yeah, so if, 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 if you read the title of this podcast and think we're going to bust a lot of myths, we didn't, but we no. put real data uh, to them so you can really understand to yep. help you make a better buying decision up front mm-hmm. uh, so you, you really know what your ROI is going to be. And then the other thing that I really want to tell people that are listening is when we say something is worth more than the other, so people are paying more for a PTO or people are paying more for tracks later in the life cycle, 
don't forget it. that price premium is not just a price premium, but it also opens up by the buyer pool. So when you open up that buyer pool, it becomes more competitive, and that's traditionally why you see higher prices. Yeah. Yep. And it, you can sell that thing faster. Absolutely. No. Good stuff, man. This is the kind of this is the kind of data that makes uh, used equipment management a uh, a lot easier to do. So, good stuff here. Well, um, Kyle, if you wanted to uh, get some more information about iron comps and tractors, and what's the best place to do that? Yeah, if you want to see all the upcoming auctions we have, we have something like seventy auctions going off in the next few weeks. Uh, I think next two weeks. So planning season is still here the coronavirus is still here but holy cow there's just there's so much auction inventory out there it's not funny so go to tractorzoom.com look at all the auction inventory and if you're interested in finding data uh, comparable sales from the auction market go to ironcomps.com and if you want to shoot us a message uh shoot me a message at k mcmahon at tractorzoom.com uh, or if it's easier to remember, info at tractorzoom.com. I'll get that as well. Right on. Okay. Well, good stuff, Kyle. Thanks for being on the podcast, and uh, we will talk to you again next month, man. Thanks, Casey. Appreciate having me. Right on. So I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Make sure you check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for all the all the latest posts and, and blog, blog posts and uh, podcast posts that I put out there. Also check out movingironllc.com for more information about uh, stuff going on with Moving Iron. And uh, last but not least, uh, check out the Global Ag Network and all the great podcasters out there. So until next time, I'm Casey Seymour with Kyle McMahon. Let's go move some iron, folks. Out. Moving Iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving Iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here